The Aztecs by Nigel Davies Chapter 9 Aztec Aftermath On August 13, 1521, Tlatelolco, heroically defended by Cuauhtémoc, fell into the power of Hernán Cortés. It was neither a triumph nor a defeat, but the painful birth of the mestizo people that is the Mexico of today. So reads at the plaque of the side of the Great Pyramid of Tlatelolco, in the square of the three cultures where the last battles took place. The ultimate achievement was noble, but the process long. It was to be the work of centuries. For the present, in 1521, in the valley of Mexico itself, the Aztec heartland, a population of about one and a half million, was left face to face with 1,000 Spaniards. They had little in common. Of these many Indians, perhaps the most resistant to domination were the erstwhile conquerors, who still cherished memories of former greatness and could yet claim the proud name of Aztec or Mexica. Later, by the end of the century, they all became simply Indians, indistinguishable from one from another. Their new master, the conqueror, had to wait for a further year until October 1522 before he finally learnt from the emperor that he was legitimate ruler of New Spain as it was now called. He bore the title of Captain General and Governor, but official recognition, when it finally came, proved to be a mixed blessing. In its train came the first of a host of trusted officials of the crown sent to restrain the conquerors and settlers, so eager for gain and, apart from Cortes, so heedless of Indian warfare. Charles V and his predecessors, the most Catholic monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella, had already learnt the bitter lesson that in the New World discovery and conquest was one thing, administration another. Once hailed as a god, the Mexican's new ruler was still loved as a man. His own concern for the Indians was genuine. He perhaps recalled how Moctezuma at their first meeting had greeted him as the heir to a long line of much-loved monarchs. In their turn, the people accorded him their esteem. They were, however, expected to pay dearly for their conqueror's affections. Later to become Marquez de Valle de Oaxaca, he carved out for himself a huge and sprawling domain, whilst some of his lesser comrades in arms went almost empty-handed. His own share of the spoils of victory was stupendous. In extensive regions of New Spain, the tribute previously paid to the Tlatoani now simply went to the captain. Indians from the Cuernavaca province were obliged to deliver every 80 days 4,800 cotton mantles, 20 rich shirts, 20 rich skirts, 10 fine bed covers, 10 coarse bed covers, and 10 cotton pillows. These were all listed pictorially, just as the tribute levies of the former rulers. That was only part of the payment. In addition, they had to cultivate ex extensive land holdings of the, of the Marquesas free of charge and supply copious livestock. They even had to provide wet nurses for his servants. After their downfall, the unfortunate Aztecs lived in a kind of spiritual vacuum. Without the guidance of their priests and rulers, the stern disciplines of the past collapsed. There was as yet little to take their place and men yielded to despair or sought consolation in drink. For several years, at least, no one knew for sure who ordered the universe. The old gods stood condemned, but the new had not yet made their presence felt, for want of instructors in their worship. The conquerors themselves were ill-fitted for such a task. Cortez's own homilies on the Virgin Mary had met with a stony response on the part of his audience, whether Moctezuma, the Fat Chief, or the Tlaxcalans. Where the, where the Spaniards had destroyed temples, the Indians simply rebuilt them. What followed, the conversion of the Indians to the Spanish faith, though not necessarily to their way of life, may be viewed in two ways. For the Indian apologist, a unique and ancient culture was trodden under. For the Catholic evangelist, Christian civilization, thwarted by Luther and the Old World, resumed its onward march in the New. To Cortes himself, conversion had always appeared as a solemn duty. Accordingly, he wrote to Charles V, begging that friars should be dispatched for the purpose of saving the souls of the Indians. An argument at first arose as to whether the Indians had souls at all. This had to be settled by the, the Pope, who recalled the injunctions of our Lord to the apostles to preach the gospel to all the nations. 
The first to arrive were three Flemish monks in 1522. Of these, the leading figure was Pedro de Jante. The problems facing them were appalling. The common people were like animals without reason. We could not bring them into the pale or congregation of the church, nor to the doctrine classes, nor to the sermons, without them fleeing from these things like the devil flees from the cross. For more than three years, they fled like wild animals from the priests. These were followed in 1524 by the famous Franciscans, the Twelve Apostles. They walked barefoot all the way from Veracruz and were greeted everywhere with joy and amazement by throngs of Indians. Accustomed to the proud conquerors, they were utterly baffled that Spaniards could be poor, emaciated, and humble. The scene, reached, the scene as they reached the city of Mexico was dramatic. Cortez himself was the first to kneel and seek to kiss the tattered habit of Fray Martin de Valencia. And when Cuauhtémoc and the other caciques saw Cortez kneel to kiss the friar's hands, they were greatly astonished. And when they saw the friars barefoot and thin, with torn habits, and without hats, on foot and without horses, and on the other hand Cortez, whom they took for some idol or something like their gods kneeling before them, they and all the Indians followed their example. Seven Augustinians were to arrive in 1533, and the Dominicans, also twelve in number, in 1536. The mendicant friars had their initial difficulties as they vainly attempted to impart their faith by signs and gestures. Soon, however, they mastered Nahuatl and began to win the hearts of their huge flock by their loving kindness and simple austerity. Their strict self-denial was in conformity with the stern practices and ideals of the Aztecs. The friars also believed in the mortification of the flesh, wore half-shirts, and scourged themselves. The fallen Aztecs were fortunate that their new ruler at least cared for their welfare. However, as governor of New Spain, he found himself in an impossible situation. He was caught between two fires. On the one hand, the government of Spain, or more properly of Castile, anxious to impose order and justice, and on the other, the conquerors and settlers, out for a quick profit by the utmost exploitation of local res resources, human and material. The contradictions in Cortes' own situation, and in that of New Spain, were made manifest over the pressing question of how to govern the country, and in particular, over the system known as the Ecomienda. The term arrives from the Spanish word ecomendar, or to give in trust. It had already existed in Spain as a temporary grant of rights to gather revenue. It then became, with disastrous consequences, the chosen instrument for governing Espan Española and Cuba. The grant of ecomienda to a Spaniard did not in itself confer land. He was simply entrusted with the Christian welfare of a large number of Indians, from whom in return he received tribute, just as the rulers of old. Unless rigidly controlled, the system was clearly open to the grossest malpractice. It might be one thing in Spain itself, but quite another when the welfare of hordes of Indians was delivered over to a few men of alien race, apt to regard them as mere beasts of burden. Accordingly, Charles V, determined to stop the spread of such abuses, had written to Cortes, expressly forbidding the installation of New Spain of this mode of control, already in part responsible for the decimation of his Indian subjects in Española. If Indians had been given an ecomienda, wrote the emperor, they were to be removed. Now the country had somehow to be ruled, and the governor had no other instrument to hand for the purpose. Having initially considered that it would be fa fatal to introduce the ecomienda system, except perhaps as far as he himself was concerned, he underwent a rapid conversion. When the emperor's letter arrived, a fait accompli had already taken place. Cortes simply refused to obey. He justified his failure to comply by the curious argument that the ecomienda would protect the Indians against the very low quality of Spaniard now flocking to New Spain. The ecomenderos had an, an obligation to bear arms in defense of their sovereign. If, if they were unable to do so, royal troops would be needed. Charles V, whose finances were far less well organized than those of the late Moctezuma, could ill afford such a luxury. Troubles now descended thick and fast upon Cortez's head. During his disastrous expedition to Honduras, intrigue was rife in the newly founded capital. To the delight of would-be successors to his honors and emoluments, he was actually reported dead, 
and a mass was said for his soul in the church of the monastery of San Francisco. Guatemoc was compelled to accompany his master on this ill-fated adventure, along together with eight grooms, two falconers, five musicians, two jigglers, and three muleteers, in addition to a herd of swine as a living larder. Things had changed since the conquest. During the long march, on the pretext of an, of an alleged plot, Cortes ordered Cuauhtémoc and the cacique of Tacuba to be hanged. According to native sources, Cuauhtémoc was the victim of mere calumny. One wonders why Doña Maria, still acting as interpreter, could not, had she wished, have ascertained the, re the real truth. Before the former ruler was hanged, he exclaimed, O Malinche, for many days I have understood that you would condemn me to this death and have known your false words, for you kill me unjustly. Bernal Diaz continues, and before they hanged him, the Franciscan friars confessed him, and I truly felt great pity for Cuauhtémoc and his cousin, having held them for great lords, and still during the march they honored me with the things which they offered, particularly in giving me some Indians to bring grass for my horse, and their death was very unjust and made a bad impression on all present. Cortes returned to the city of Mexico in 1526 to be confronted by an official armed with full powers known as a juez de residencia. This new watchdog of the Spanish government, Luis Ponce de Leon, died shortly thereafter. He had assigned his powers to Marcos de Aguilar, an old man who kept himself alive by, sus by sucking milk from a w woman's breast. He was in such a weak state of health that power was for the present retained by Cortes. As a next step, the Council of the Indies in Seville, stricken with an apparent fit of madness, vested the government of New Spain in the first audience, held by the infamous Nuno de Guzman. Two of the four members of the audience died of pneumonia. The remaining two, together with Guzman, settled in the house of Cortes, still Captain General, but exiled from the city of Mexico by Estrada, who had temporarily held the governorship before the arrival of the audience. Guzman's principal aim was to enrich himself and ruin Cortes. He found a staunch adversary in Bishop Zumarraga, bishop-elect of Mexico, and officially appointed as protector of the Indians, a rather imprecise title previously held by Bishop Las Casas. Zumarraga succeeded in smuggling a letter to Seville via Veracruz recounting the enormities of the members of the audience. Meanwhile, Cortes himself in 1528 had left for Spain. Once the crowd became aware of what was happening, the first audience was replaced by the second, composed this time of men of integrity and standing. These in their turn were followed by the first viceroy, Don Antonio de Mendoza, former ambassador to Hungary and a member of the once great families of Spain. His coming was delayed for five whole years while he argued about his future emol emoluments. Finally, in, f in November 1535, he arrived and was received with joyous celebrations. The relations between Cortes, returned to New Spain, and, Men and Mendoza were not slow to deteriorate. In 1542, Cortes adopted the somewhat undignified procedure of drawing up a petition against the viceroy summing up his numerous grievances. He retired once more to Spain and died in 1547 after taking part in Charles V's unsuccessful siege of Algiers. His bones now lie buried in the left-hand part of the altar of the Church of the Hospital of Jesus in the city of Mexico. The title of Marquez de Valle de Oaxaca, which he bore, still survives and belongs to a wrecked descendant of the conqueror, who also holds the Sicilian dukedom of Terra Nova and Monte Leone. It is of equal interest that Moctezuma can still boast of a direct descendant in Spain, though none are known in Mexico, in the person of the fourth duke of Moctezuma of, Tol of Toltengo, who succeeded to the title in 1956. It was upgraded to a dukedom in 1864. The, ever, the present ducal family is descended from Don Pedro Moctezuma, the eleventh son of the Tlatoani. Moctezuma II was, moreover, not the last of his name to rule. His, de his descendant, Don Jose Sanmiento y Valladeros, Conde de Moctezuma y, y Tula, was viceroy from 1696 until 701.
1701, excuse me. The fate of the common people depended primarily upon the institutions and laws by which they were governed, and about which a few words are therefore, are therefore necessary. In most respects, Spanish rule in North and Central America came simply as the successor state of the Aztec Empire, with, with the major difference that, poli that policy was now determined, not in the central metropolis of Tenochtitlan, but at a vast distance from Mexico and by men basically well-intentioned in, well but often ill-advised. As we have seen, the Spanish crown had initially been forced to yield to a fate to comply and to give temporary tolerance to the ecomienda system. In the mid-1550s, 130 ecomenderos in the Valley of Mexico controlled some 180,000 Indians. As Professor Gibson has pointed out, the record of the first generation of ecomenderos was one of generalized abuse and particular atrocities. Unlike the previous rulers, these privileged few, whose attitude to the Indian was conditioned by their experience in by their experiences in Española, cared little for those whose welfare they were charged, and in, and in most cases received their tribute without ever seeing them. Bishop Las Casas waxes eloquent on the abuses of this system, the chief target for his crusade on behalf of the of the Indians. He reports that one ecomendero entrusted with the Christian welfare of many souls, did not know how to sign his own name, or even how to, cr even how to cross himself. Another, after his Indians had delivered up their idols to the friars, secured some more from elsewhere and sold them to the same natives, proving perhaps that the trade in pre-Hispanic relics is older than one sometimes thinks. In the early 1530s, the Spanish government began to appoint salaried royal officials, known as corregidores, to reside in the principal towns and take over the duties of the ecomenderos. The, the powers of the latter were definitely on the wane 20 years later as the new system developed. By 1570, some ecomiendas still survived but under stricter control and the victory of the crown was by then almost complete. From the native point of view, the change to the corregidores was, in theory, at least for the better. However, the improvement was somewhat relative. The Indians were an easy target for abuse, and according to some reports, the corregidores treated them even worse than the ecomenderos. They tended to use their office for personal gain, and as royal officials, were difficult to punish for illegal acts. Moreover, whatever the system of rule, exactions had to continue. The same methods continued in force, to, prov to provide funds for Spain's European wars. The Spanish crown and the Council of the Indies, in seeking to provide for the good government of their glittering new possessions, were victims of a kind of tug-of-war between conflicting interests. On one hand, prodded at home by the indefat indefatigable and formidable Bishop Las Casas, and in New Spain, by the orders of the mendicant friars, quick to attack any abuse, they issued a stream of humanitarian legislation, such as has seldom, if ever, been matched in the course of colonial history. And even if the effects were sometimes negligible, no one could accuse the, Sp the Spanish government of any but the best in intentions. On the other hand, pressed with the necessity of obtaining money to support the boundless dynastic ambition of the Habsburgs, they were often obliged to countenance the actions of those who govern on the spot and who regarded many of these edicts as merely utopian. The settlers were certainly not prepared to work with their own hands and could not have existed, let alone prospered, without some form of Indian forced labor, on which even the church partly depended. Failing bounteous material rewards, the Spanish would simply have abandoned an ailing colony, and the conquest might as well never have taken place at all. But if the surviving Aztecs looked on the average Spaniard as an enemy, they also possessed friends. Never before in history can an alien conqueror have produced such an array of scholars and saints to espouse the cause of the vanquished. Foremost among these, for sheer tenacity if for nothing else, was Bishop Las Casas. He had lived in Española from 1502 until 1512 and had himself held an ecomienda. He relented and became a, Dom a Dominican friar. Henceforth, for fifty years, his life was one unceasing struggle on behalf of the Indians. For Las Casas, in accordance with the Papal Bull of 1493, the Spaniards were entitled to claim temporal dominion over the Indies for the sole and specific purpose of converting the inhabitants to Christianity. This single-minded, fanatical advocate of their cause became a power at the court of Charles V. 
In his voluminous writings to his sovereign, he did not mince his words. He expounded at the greatest length of his, his twenty reasons why the Indians should not be given these to the Spaniards in Ecomienda. As they, the Indians, weep night and day, the thought may well occur to them that their own gods were better than our God, for under his rule they suffer such ills. While with their former deities, all went well and there was no one to harm them as the Christians do, and as a consequence, they are likely to recoil from the new faith and abhor it. His sixth reason put things yet plainer. The sixth reason is that the Spaniards subvert, ruin, and destroy the lives of the Indians, and are the capital enemies of their whole race, or hostess, as one says in Latin. Of this there can be no doubt, nor any necessity for proof, because all these things are perfectly manifest. Las Casas emphasizes to the emperor the lamentable impression the Indians perforce gain of Christianity by watching their Spanish masters. And the Indians do not take the possessions of others, they do not molest, injure, or attack anyone. And they see the Spaniards indulging in all kinds of offense and iniquity, together with every evil that man can commit, against all reason and justice. And finally, the Indians may scoff and mock at all if they are told of God, and some believe nothing, and are so skeptical that they, that really they do not revere God, but think that he is the most iniquitous and wicked of gods, since he has such worshippers. They further believe that your majesty must be the most cruel and unjust of kings, since you send such subjects hither and keep them here. In general, other leading religious concurred with these opinions. Some, however, felt that Las Casas at times went too far in stating his case. He even succeeded in provoking by his arbitrary ways the animosity of the saintly Motolinia. The latter also uses strong words in writing to Charles V. He, Las Casas, was restless in New Spain and did not learn any Indian tongue, nor did he humble himself to teach them. His occupation was to write charges on every hand, and of the sins that the Spaniards have committed, and in it he exaggerates a great deal. And truly this one activity ought not to take him to heaven, because what he writes is not all true or well substantiated. It must have, it must indeed have been hard for the Spanish government to, un, to unravel such an imbroglio, when even the, the leading religious in New Spain could not agree among themselves. To supplement the laws of Burgas, promulgated in 1512 in a belated attempt to save the remaining Indians of Española and neighboring islands from, ex, from extermination, and the Spanish government now formulated the new laws. This action followed Las Casas' return to Spain. He was sent by the general council of the, Dom of the Dominican order. Held in the city of Mexico in 1539 in order to solicit preventive legislation from the Council of the Indies. The new laws went so far as to prescribe the Ecomunda system and provided for severe sanctions in all cases of excesses against Indians. In particular, slavery was forbidden. Far from relying on local officers for their enf enforcement, special commissioners were sent <laughs> for the purpose from Spain. Needless to say, the excellent intentions of the Spanish crown, as expressed in this legislation, were very hard to put into effect. Even the friars of Las Casas' own Dominican order dismissed as impractical the immediate abolition of the Ecomienda. However, at least a modicum of protection was being established for the inhabitants of New Spain. In the 1530s and 1540s, royal officers fixed limits to the exactions of the Ecomenderos. In certain cases, they were even arrested or forced to pay back excess tribute. Probably, therefore, thanks to such measures and to the men who had inspired them, the period of the cruelest abuses was passing. However, as we shall see, they had exacted a heavy toll. Certain misdeeds of the early colonial period have given rise to the famous black legend concerning Spanish behavior in the Indies. It is often attributed to the invective of Protestant militants and other Spaniard haters. But if the truth be told, it must surely be ascribed to the great Las Casas himself. No anti-Spaniard could have been more virulent in the abuse he poured upon the heads of the settlers in, in Mexico, even referring to them as wolves, lions, and tigers, preying upon the helpless natives. To sum up, it may be useful to quote Professor Gibson, a leading authority on the, on the period. The black legend provides a gross but essentially accurate interpretation of relations between Spaniards and Indians. The legend builds upon the record of deliberate sadism. It flourishes in an atmosphere of indignation, 
which removes the issue from the category of objective understanding. It is insufficient in its awareness of the institutions of colonial history. But the substantive content of the black legend asserts that Indians were exploited by Spaniards, and empirical f and an empirical fact, they were. The name Aztec, as previously explained, is little more than a convenient term to describe an empire jointly conquered by the Mexicans, the, the, the Texcocans, and the Tacubans. In a stricter sense of the word, the Aztecs theref therefore ceased to exist once the empire was dissolved and the alliance which created it. Naturally, however, the previous conquerors lived on as well as their former subjects. The institutions under which they were now compelled to exist have been briefly described. It remains to examine the fate of the Aztec peoples under the new regime, no longer as masters of all they surveyed, but as servants of their victors. Not surprisingly, the rulers initially fared better than the people. The Spanish Ecomenderos were clearly not in a position to rule their charges directly. The Indian upper class, accordingly, served as a useful instrument for controlling the, the lower. The Spaniards, moreover, possessed an inherent regard for aristocratic values and respected the hereditary principle. Cortes even went so far as to recognize the authority of the second in the land after the ruler, the woman snake. As a part of this policy, Moctezuma's own descendants received ecomiendas on a par with the conquistadors. Cortes, in particular, took good care of Moctezuma's daughters and married several to well-born Spaniards. The heirs of Nesahuapili became caciques of Texcoco, initially fairly powerful, though their influence tended to decline. The word cacique, used by the Spaniards for señor or ruler, did not originate in Mexico, but was of Arawakian origin. Concerning the actual dynasty of Tenochtitlan, Cortes adopted the usual procedure. By Aztec standards of having the woman snake, Don Diego Velasquez Tlacotzin, succeed Cuauhtémoc in 1525. He ruled for only one year, and the next two rulers were not of royal blood and did not become Tlatoani in the full sense. In 1539, the dynasty was restored in the person of Don Diego Juanitzin, a grandson of the former ruler Ashayacat. He, in turn, was succeeded in 1542 by a grandson of Tisok. The last ruler from 1554 to 1563 was Don Luis de Santa Maria Nacatzipatzin. When he died, as the chronicler sadly remarks, thus ended the rule of the sons of the much-loved kings of the Tenochka in Mexico, Tenochtitlan. It may be interesting to note that whereas the title of Tlatoani soon became extinct in Tenochtitlan, it still continues to be used even today in the other places in the indigenous hierarchy. For instance, the highest dignitary of his kind in Cholula is known as Tlatoani. These rulers of Tenochtitlan and Texcoco forfeited all dominion over neighboring cities and retained some authority only over a, a limited territory surrounding their own capitals. Moreover, Tlatelolco once became a more separate entity. The Spanish administ administrative unit for controlling New Spain was the, the Cabecera, or principal town. Every place that had previously possessed a local ruler of its own, acting as an Aztec vassal, now became a Cabecera. Where cities had possessed several rulers in former times, they sometimes remained divided into separate units. More often, however, they were united under one cacique. These Cabeceras cons constituted the centers of Indian local government, and the local nobi nobility normally resided there. The estancias, or subdivisions of each cabecera, usually followed the somewhat irregular pre-Hispanic pattern, with places owing allegiance to one center interspersed with those belonging to another. Naturally, every place now wanted to claim the dignity of being a cabecera, and this led to much Indian litigation, as each pressed its claim based on ancient territorial divisions as defined by codices. Such a procedure was not always free from fraud and deceit. The caciques were, of course, strictly subject to Spanish authority. They were merely responsible for local or, mun or municipal administration, including such matters as markets, roads, water supply, as well as the provision of labor for Spanish projects. In particular, they had to collect the tribute for the ecomenderos, through a system still based on Moctezuma's imperial levy. 
and their position was perhaps not unlike that of tribal chiefs in certain British colonies. They became progressively hispanized, wearing swords and Spanish clothing, and even carrying firearms. They furnished their houses with beds, tables, and chairs, previously unknown, and sometimes even known Negro slaves. They continued to marry among themselves. Mon mon monogamy was, of course, now obligatory. It was, however, often a thorny problem for the friars to disentangle the conflicting claims of existing wives to the new honor of sole spouse, or to know how to dispose of the wives rendered surplus by such provisions. Moreover, the temptation was ever present to profit by the occasion and make a clean sweep of all existing wives, grown old and ugly. The cacique could then start afresh with a new and pretty one, in support of whose legal claim subject witnesses would naturally produce ample and impeccable evidence. The influence of these hereditary rulers gradually declined. In the first place, the tributary system was modified, which had served to provide them, as well as the ecomenderos, with a living. Until the middle of the 16th century, payment was made in produce, as under the Aztecs. This impost was then gradually converted into a kind of head tax, payable in money, not in kind. Secondary, the authority of the rulers was superseded by the elected Indian officials, based on the Spanish system of, of municipal government. Those so chosen were called gobernadores, or governors, and were assisted by a kind of council composed of regidores. It is a mark of respect in which the former Tlatoanis were held that in many cases the existing sovereign was chosen for the new office. The last rulers of Tenochtitlan were also governors. The electorate, it might be added, was conservative in nature and restricted in number, resembling more an English pocket borough than a modern constituency. While the former rulers could to some extent feather their own nests in the early years of Spanish rule, the common people were less fortunate. Even the Aztec merchant class disappeared and was replaced by a new generation of Indian traders. The people did not merely suffer, they began to disappear. Disease, rather than ill treatment, has now been recognized as the major cause of depopulation, and in particular the academics of 1545 through 1548 and of 1576 through 1581. They have never been clinically diagnosed, but were surely attributable to such infections as smallpox and measles, against which the natives enjoyed no immunity. The Spanish remedy of bleeding merely increased the mortality rate. The figures speak for themselves. The population of the Valley of Mexico declined by 1570 to 325,000 from a pre-conquest total of about one and a half millions. Unlike their rulers, the people, or those who survived, continued to live much as before, though certain efforts were made to induce them to sleep in beds, wear clothes, and abandon drunkenness, the scourge of post-conquest Mexico. Some Indians le learned Spanish, but few gave up their own languages. Diet was largely unchanged, though by the end of the century the eating of dog was limited to ceremonial occasions, re replaced by pork and other meat. According to some Indians, pork rem rem reminded them of human flesh formerly ritually consumed on such festive occasions. Dog, of course, also had relig religious connotations, and its continued sale in Alcoman gave rise to the strongest expressions of disgust on the part of the distinguished chronicler Padre Duran. He places the consumption of dog in the same category as the eating of weasels and mice. Under the stress of change, and faced with the dissolution of their society, the native population, literally, took to drink, so severely controlled in pre-Hispanic times and largely limited to religious ceremonies. As the population decreased, production of pulque actually rose, as areas previously under maize cultivation were turned over to the growing of the agave plant. Spurred by the friars' protests at excessive drinking, the Spanish administration made serious efforts to limit this addiction. Their ineffectiveness well illustrates the, the, the difficulties facing the new and alien elite. The laws of the Aztecs may have been draconian, but they were obeyed. The Indians initially retained their communal lands. Later, owing to depopulation, many, be many became un unoccupied. This facilitated Spanish acquisition of property. These communal holdings, moreover, suffered continually from the depredations of Spanish-owned cattle, in spite of visceral regulations for the protection of Indian property. Further lands became vacant and available for Spanish occupation towards the end of the century through the policy of congregating the natives into more concentrated settlements. 
This was done ostensibly to facilitate supervision, to promote Christian living, and to prevent drunkenness. If such worthy objectives were not fully achieved, the spread of disease was certainly facilitated. Among the scourges listed by Fray Motolinia as afflicting the Indians was forced labor, and above all the continued tolerance of slavery, mainly to supply the growing labor demands of the new mines. In fairness, it must be borne in mind that the Spaniards themselves, if taken by the Turks, were enslaved, and that this treatment was considered as the normal lot of infidel prisoners of war. Following such precepts, Columbus had gone so far as to sell Indians as slaves in Spain until ordered to stop by an irate Queen Isabella in 1495. In spite of his lyrical descriptions of the Pacific characters of the, of the Indian, he evidently planned to establish a regular trade in Indian slaves. The recently developed mines needed Indian slaves to supplement the supply of Negroes. The importation of the latter had been originally proposed by three Geronimite monks sent to redeem Española from the abuses of previous governors. Slaves could be inquired on the theory that Indians taken in rebellion or who resisted the advance of the Spaniards could lawfully be enslaved. Spanish legislation only gradually brought such abuses under partial control some 15 years after the conquest. A law was passed stipulating that all slaves must be released before royal officers, must be registered before royal officers. Failing this, they were to be released. The branding iron was henceforth kept in a metal box with two keys. One of these was to be left in the custody of Bishop Zumaraga, the officially appointed protector of the Indians. In their travails, the Indians were offered the solace of the cross, a blessing initially unwanted, for it is quite erroneous to suppose that they were at all eager to espouse their conqueror's faith. To quote Professor Jimenez Moreno, It has not been emphasized sufficiently that a considerable proportion, if not the majority of the Indians of the ancient Mexican Empire, were obliged in the first half of the 16th century to abandon their old religion by force. This reluctance was amply illustrated when the saintly Franciscans met with the Aztec chiefs and priests in an initial effort at conversion. The friars first made an appropriate address out, outlining the Christian message. The princes or rulers replied, expressing deep appreciation that such fine gems and precious stones had been shown to them, the normal figure of speech for something significant or beautiful. They preferred that their priests, sages versed, in the counting of the years and learned in the course of the stars should give a full answer. They spoke as follows. You have told us that we are ignorant of him to whom we have life and being, and who is the Lord of the, of the sky and of the earth. Equally, you say that those whom we adore are not gods. This manner of speech seems to us very unfamiliar and shocking. We are horrified at such words, because our ancestors who gave us life and commanded us never told us such things. From times long past they handed down to us the custom that we should worship our gods. The priest went on to explain to the friars that their gods had provided the necessities of life for, for countless ages past. It would be an act of levity to destroy their ancient laws, and thus incur their, ex their extreme wrath. Sufficient let it be that the justice and the power of our kings has been taken away from us. In what concerns our gods, we would rather die than abandon their service and worship. This is our resolve. Do as you will. This exchange of views took place some four years after the conquest. The coming of the friars marked the end of that stage interlude, during which the old gods, if vanquished, were still present, while the new had not yet arrived. Naturally, former practices con continued. The Spaniards apparently did not react strongly, as long as they did not actually see human sacrifices, Plenty were still carried out in secret. The first real battle against the ancient deities was fought in 1525 in Texcoco, where pagan temples still abounded. Sermons were, per were preached and action was pursued to extirpate the old practices. Steps were then taken in other places, including the city of Mexico, and many temples were destroyed. A continuous struggle was now to be fought. By 1531, Bishop Zumarraga was boasting that he had destroyed 500 temples and 20,000 idols. Many precious codices, alas, were added to the bishop's bonfire. It was the Emperor Charles himself who, rec who recommended the use of the stones of the temples for building, of, for building the churches. The coming of the Twelve Franciscans had been a notable event. In spite of the unbending attitude of former priests and rulers, the impact of their presence on the common people was profound. This indeed was the first step towards bridging the gulf that yawned between conquerors and conquered. These were Spaniards who were as poor as they, and who lived as they did, sharing the same hardships. The friars certainly had work on their hands, 
and by the end of 1524, a million Indians had already been baptized after somewhat hasty instruction. Language was a major difficulty. The religious were opposed to the Indians learning Spanish, and therefore they themselves had no alternative but to master the native languages. Where the population was ethnically mixed, cases would even occur of sermons being preached in several different tongues during one Mass. Moreover, it was sometimes difficult to translate Christian notions into native languages at all. Even for the telling of the parable of the wise and foolish versions, the Spanish words for oil and lamp had to be used. Certain concepts had no counterpart in some languages. When the Jesuits reached Lower California at the end of the 17th century, they could only make clear the meaning of resurrection to the unlettered natives of that region by immersing flies in water, taking them out before they drown, and then letting them come to life again. That there should be no relapse on the part of Indian converts, it was essential to instill a healthy terror of hellfire. Notions of the underworld and their own religion were sh less sharply de defined, and the concept of hell as a punishment for sin almost absent. To illustrate the torments of the damned, Fray Luis Calderon was obliged to adopt unorthodox methods. He arranged the kind of oven. Dogs and cats were thrown into the fire, and their cries of pain vividly demonst demonstrated the horrors awaiting those Indians who ignored the friar's teaching. The latter were so successful as to create a kind of religious fanaticism among certain of their flock. Mindful of the practices of their old faith, it was not uncommon for new converts to express su surprise and regret if their confessors did not order them to be scourged. After a slow start, the fight against paganism was undertaken with zeal. Possibly such a crusade provided an outlet for the ardor of the Aztecs, now deprived of their campaigns of conquest. Not unnaturally, resistance to conversion was still at times encountered. Some even parodied the mass by worshipping a maize cake. Upper-class parents would hide their children and send the, son of, the sons of slaves to the religious schools in their place. Sorcerers and magicians in the early years sought to convince the Indians that the water used for baptism was really blood, that the friars were dead men and their habits winding sheets. At night, they were supposed to disappear and join their women in hell. An alternative version of such stories suggests that the, real, that the religious had never been children and that they had been born dressed in their habits. In order to stop pagan practices, sanctions were enforced. Indians were punished for failing to confess. Idolaters from Texcoco were, were executed in the 1530s. The friars at times had to resort to corporal punishment, and it was not until the 17th century that church jails were forbidden. Problems, moreover, were caused by the use of forced labor for ecclesiastical purposes. The beautiful 16th century monasteries, which abound in Mexico today, were not merely built of the, of the very stones of the pyramids. They were surrounded by a similar type of crelinated wall and constructed under the same system of collective Indian labor. However, despite any shortcomings and misunderstandings, the Indians dearly loved their friars. This is well il illustrated by the anger occasion when the Franciscan friars were, t were taken away from San Iwan Teotihuacan and replaced by others. The people refused to supply the newcomers with food and became so insubordinate that the civil authorities were forced to resort to violence and imprisonment in an attempt to restore discipline. It was all to no avail. In the end, the, vi the villagers had their way and the Franciscans returned. When they arrived, such was their delight that they forgot all the miseries they had suffered and with great joy they built a holy convent and a very fine church in a few days. Gradually, moreover, Early tensions eased as the Mexicans, at times, to the distaste of the Spanish ecclesiastics, made their own contributions to their faith. Above all, their devotion to the Virgin of Guadalupe helped to give the Aztecs an identity of their own within the framework of New, of New Spain. On December 9, 1531, a simple native called Juan Diego first saw a beautiful Indian lady dressed in shining garments on the, on the hill of Tepeyacac, where the Basilica of Guadalupe now stands. She spoke in Nahuatl and identified herself as the Mother of God. He went and related his vision to visit Zumaraga. In all, he saw the Virgin and the Bishop four times. Initially, the friars displayed a fierce hostility towards the new cult. Clerical efforts at suppression, however, did not succeed. And today, the Virgin of Guadalupe, the Indian Virgin par excellence, is hollow not only in Mexico but, but also throughout Spanish America. The early attitude of the religious is not altogether surprising. 
The hill of Tepayacac formerly housed the shrine of the goddess Tonantzi, meaning our, our mother. This deity is even to be identified with Coatlicue, the mother of Huitzilopochtli, with her necklace of human hearts and hands. The coming of Christianity may have served to soften the rigors of their altered life under alien masters. The Indian conversion, however, tended towards the superficial. Native attitudes and habits did not change. As Motolinia compl complains, they just wanted to have a, a hundred and one gods instead of a hundred. The Christian god was admitted, but not necessarily as a sole deity. Moreover, the notion died hard that a god could only exist by virtue of the sustenance and support provided by his adherents. Saints were, and often still are, not loving intermediaries, but themselves anthropom anth anthropomorphic deities, quick to anger and eager to punish transgressions unless appeased by the gifts of clothing, food, and drink. It remains to say something of the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan, raised to the ground by the conquest. Rebuilding was a pressing task, and for the purpose, Cortez changed the woman snake, charged the woman snake with the task of bringing back the Indian population sc scattered after the siege. Cortez himself took the decision to retain the former site. The newly built capital would thus be subject to floods and surrounded by swamplands, for it was not the intention to build another Aztec lagoon city but a Spanish capital, with the finest Spanish churches, houses, streets, and squares. Some of these, in altered form, survive today. Following the replacement of many canals by streets, there was no way the water could flow if the rains were severe, and the dangers of, fl of floods was increased. The task of building was backbreaking, and, and Motolinia lists the use of forced labor for the erection of Mexico Tenochtitlan, as the city was, na was now called, as one of the plagues afflicting the Indians. Flood control itself over the century was to require armies of laborers and cost many lives. Following the critical inundation of 1555, the viceroy summoned a force of 6,000 Indians to build a dike four miles long. He had previously asked the governors of Tenochtitlan, Texcoco, and Tacuba, the heads of the former Triple Alliance, to produce ancient paintings showing how their ancestors had protected the city from, from flood. The organization of the labor force followed the pre-Hispanic pattern. The work, however, was of unusual severity, and many workers died. It was not until 1608 that a tunnel four miles long was completed, draining part of the lagoon from the water of the valley of Mexico into the Tula River. This did not prevent even more devastating floods in 1629, when streets, squares, and causeways stood under several feet of water. Food shortage became acute, houses collapsed, and trade came to a halt. It was even suggested that the city should be transferred to the mainland. Only after the 18th century was the work finally completed of transforming the tunnel into an open canal, and the flood problem consequently reduced. In the city of Mexico, the Spaniards formed their own town, with its separate municipal authority. The Indian community of San Juan de Nochtitlan sur surrounded this settlement and remained divided into the four original quarters or sub-districts established at the time of its foundation. The ruling family gradually lost its power and its authority was assumed by elected Indian mayors, both for Tenochtitlan and for Tlatelolco. The Tlatelolco market still functioned in 1550, but by the end of the century the Indian government had lost all control over commerce and tribute collection. In spite of a tendency to neglect the Indians, in Mexico Tenochtitlan, much attention was paid to higher education. Special establishments were created, of which the most important were San Jose and Tenochtitlan and the College of Santa Cruz and Tlatelolco. The students were the sons of caciques. Latin, logic, philosophy, and theology were taught. The decline in population throughout the country naturally affected the capital. In pre-Hispanic times, Tenochtitlan Tlatelolco had been larger than any European city, probably reaching a quarter of a million. By 1562, it had sunk to 75,000. Only in recent years has the city of Mexico regained its status as one of the great capitals of the modern world. This concludes Chapter 9 and this book.